and we're live. Excellent. How are you doing? <laughs> Good, man. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Come back from France, which was absolutely lovely. And as soon as I hit Britain, I came down with a, um, some kind of nasty chest infection. So it's no good for you being being here. I don't recommend it. It's, it's the weather's not good enough. So, a nasty uh, yeah. chest infection. Ooh, that does not sound good. No, it's not good. But your podcast Flare up in COVID as well, which I also caught in London. So it doesn't seem like London's doing my health any good. How's <laughs> California COVID. treating you? I don't have any of those symptoms. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it was 115 degrees the other day. But wow. uh, things are good, man. Things are good. So can't complain. Great. It's beautiful summer. I was actually in England up the road from you, and we never even connected because you were going to Italy or some amazing place. France, I think. Yeah. yeah. France. Right. And uh, yeah. I, I was there. You were in France. And uh, such is life. But, yeah, it was a great time. So, it was. Beautiful summer. Yeah, absolutely. So now the summer's coming to an end, and maybe the summer in e-commerce is drawing to a close as well, and we're entering some interesting times. Um, so we're going to be talking about pricing today. You're one of your specialist subjects. Obviously, you mm -hmm. brought out Pricing Power recently, the book. Um, so an, an overlooked topic. So uh, we're going to talk about three problem areas today, I believe. Is that right? Mm, yeah. Let me jump into it here, and uh, we'll we'll start the podcast officially. As is our custom, we'll record this live. If you're watching with us live, feel free to ask questions in the comments. We'd love to weave your questions into the scenario. So let me start the, the top of the show here. Setting prices can be incredibly challenging. Sometimes you have to be a price taker and take what the market gives you. Other times you can be a price setter and you can do it with confidence. The reality is there are three big challenges with setting prices that we want to talk about in today's show, but we're also going to explain how you can be a pricing genius, not to be too hyperbolic in the intro here, how you can be a pricing genius in spite of these three challenges. So we're going to make this quick because Michael's sick and my co-host is is uh, going to limp through this here, I think. But Michael, I'm really excited to record this session with you. So you're going to be able to hang in here with me, buddy. I think so. Yeah, I should just um, mute myself and not splutter at people too much. But yeah, I like the idea of being a price maker, not a price taker. I mean, that's something that um, many Amazon or market based sellers can only dream of. So uh, without going in a rabbit hole, tell me a little bit yeah. about the difference there and how you yeah. think you become one or the other. Well, that's a classic economics phrase, uh, price taking, price making. So the, the difference there is you have pricing power if you can make the prices what you want. And you don't have pricing power if you have to take what the market will will give you. And so those are those are really classic economics uh, you know, terms. And so, yeah, we will obviously we want to be price makers. We want to be able to say, here's our price point and it helps our business succeed and customers will pay for it. And so that's the gist of the whole the whole premise behind the pricing power book is how do you put yourself in the position to be a price maker? not a price taker. And so, but it's challenging as we all know, <laughs> because there are, uh, there are obstacles in our way. And so we want to talk about three of those today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reality is according to psychological research and pricing research is done. There's a guy named Ernest Weber who's done a lot of research in this regard. There is no absolute price for any product. And I think we'll know this if we kind of put our consumer hat on. But if we're managing a business and trying to set prices, we want it to be, you know, $17.99 is the perfect price. But the reality is for consumers, uh, the economic economists have tested things and they've realized that what actually happens in the mind of the consumer is that there's a range of prices. Um, and so there, the range of prices is, uh, is what customers think about, uh, in, in, in their mindset. Ooh, Michael, I think people are saying hello, but they're also saying in, uh, I think on StreamYard, you were muted that last conversation. Yeah. I, you gave a beautiful answer, but, um, I was not muted on on um, call him, so you heard the question, but the people on stream I didn't hear the question. So the, the difference was, I better ask you this question because we can put it into the recording, which is now going to be fun to edit. Um, so what is the first of the three unfortunate facts? Um, the answer is um, there's no perfect price, I think. There is no perfect price. That is the, uh, the first unfortunate reality 
psychologists and economists have figured out what a customer does is says in their mind, there's a range of prices I'm willing to pay for something. And it doesn't matter what it is, a cup of coffee or a, you know, a car or a new computer or phone, uh, lawn care service, or the guy who's going to, you know, put chlorine in your pool every week. There's a range of prices that we say in our minds, oh, that's fair. And, and in that range, what happens is the buyer gets into a buyer frenzy. Like if they need it, they'll buy it because it's in that range and it, it reduces their psychological kind of overwhelm and they don't have to think about it. They just say, I need this. It's in the price range that my mind says is acceptable. I'm pulling the trigger on the purchase. Um, and so that's good news, bad news. Good news is if you operate in that range, you're fine. But bad news is a lot of times that range isn't fun profit wise. You know? <laughs> and if you think about Howard Schultz, uh, you know, back in the seventies, you know, a cup of coffee was like 59 cents or whatever. And he did not want to operate in that price range. And so, you know, the, the drama ensues, you know, like how, how do you get out of that channel of pricing when you want to, uh, to, uh, you know, kind of explore higher prices and be more profitable. And I'm going to give a couple answers in this conversation. Great. So well, we'll talk about how to be the genius pricer in a moment, but this is this is one of the problems is, you know, you, you don't want to be in the range of acceptable pricing. Usually you want to be higher priced than that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the problems coming into the, the current situation is that for a lot of people, their um, cost prices for the, the sellers will be such that if they sold at their preferred uh, consumer's selling price, i.e., you know, the, the retail price, uh, it might actually have zero profit or loss built into yeah. it, right? So actually yeah. premium pricing now could simply mean profit pricing as opposed to just selling a break even or worse. So I mean, I right. think a, an awful lot of the, the planet's in that situation, right? So certainly in the UK. Um, one question well, about the perfect, well, sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say exactly right. I mean, what's the efficient market theory is that there is a perfect, the uh, the, the perfect, you know, price point that, that moves the goods. Um, well, there, there's no profit in that system. It's, you know, it's, like, it's optimized for, you know, super efficiency, not for you to make a, a good living. And so, you know, that's the, that's the drama and that's what we have to manage and we have to do it professionally and well. And that's the whole gist of, of these ideas. Yeah. So one question that springs to mind for me is, um, how about finding the perfect price experimentally using software? So obviously repricing mm -hmm. tools for resellers have been used a lot for years. Obviously one of our sponsors, uh, Eva, runs the uh, repricing for private label goods. So harder to implement mm -hmm. technically, but possible. H how does that factor in, in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's one of the ways in which you can discover the optimal, the price optimal outcome for you all things being equal, the price optimal outcome for a consumer is the lower the price, the better. They would like it for free. Thank you very much. They'd even like you to pay them to actually take your product. That's the price optimal outcome for the consumer. But the question is, what's the price optimal outcome for the seller? And that's where we really find these nuances. So a lot of times what the pricing algorithm or tools will teach you, if you do an A-B test for your pricing on Shopify or if you do serial testing, on Amazon with your price points, what you, you can discover is that you can sell at a higher price and you'll have less velocity, you know, less transactions will flow through, but you'll end up optimizing for profit. And that's a very, very interesting set of tests to do. And what it makes you realize is that just selling more isn't the answer, you know, selling the appropriate priced amount that gives you a profit and getting it sold you know at that price is the optimal outcome for you and so uh, the software tools absolutely allow you to do that uh, or at least test your way into it and if you can figure out how to put your prices a bit higher but still maintain some velocity to get the you know you, the, your your quantities moving um then you've got an opportunity there to you know also have profit as well yeah absolutely um couple of thoughts on that one is with private label sellers, I've always seen because you have to order in bulk and you have to hold inventory for quite a long time. There's always a really terrible payoff, a reality between the amount of um, turnover speed. In other words, um, how long are you going to hang on to your inventory for, which has a yeah. working capital implication or more cash flow implication versus profit. And those two things are in a great tension. They're not exactly in opposite directions, but there is a great tension between them. So 
I think you have to be realistic about that if that's your business model right now. The other thing is um, talking about sort of pricing ranges that you were talking about. I think A-B testing often reveals, doesn't it, that you can creep towards the top of your pricing range, as you said, if you get more profit per unit, but fewer units sold, and you can creep towards the bottom of it and sell more units at less profit, but it's still going to work within a range, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't, I mean, it sounds like an obvious point to make, but I see people put a bit too much faith in A-B testing. Mm -hmm. It will show you what the market thinks of your product, perhaps more granularly than you would have done organically, but it won't make your brand more valuable and more, you know, convert at a higher price point or, um, you know, be, be uh, or just convert better in yeah. my experience. Yeah. So in other words, yeah, it's not a brand it's... changer, you know. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Yeah, absolutely right. And there's reasons for that. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a couple minutes here. Um, so Fantastic. let's talk about this, the second yeah. unfortunate. Well, this second unfortunate fact. It sounds like it's Sherlock Holmes mystery. Like <laughs> it. The three unfortunate cat facts of Mr. G. Miles. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. You know, the, the reality is the second unfortunate fact is that customers anticipate pricing discounts. And it's really an interesting exercise to ask yourself as a seller, are you pricing your products for your best customers that repeat repeatedly buy all the time or are you pricing your products for the first time unaware and unknowing buyer the, you know kind of the, the the brand new to you buyer and the reality is it's easy to price for the brand new unaware of your prior activities buyer and it's a lot harder to price for your best customers because your best customers know what you do they, they pay attention, especially the super price conscious ones. And as we go into a recession, a lot of people are in, think we're in one uh, right now. Um, the price conscious so shoppers really rise to the occasion and they pay attention. And, and if they're a loyal customer of yours, they'll remember when you had a sale. And a lot of times they'll remember more than you will. Like, what did have we put this on sale before? I, I can't remember. Did we? I don't know. Maybe it was six months ago. Oh, no, that was three years ago. You don't even remember this stuff, but the customer remembers and they will anticipate the discount. So if you think you're smart by making a, you know, Black Friday sale every November, just realize the customer's anticipating that fact, because if you're being super obvious and just, you know, very kind of autopilot, change it on certain days, whatever, uh, customers will will pay attention to that. And therefore, what that means is they will not buy your product at the higher price, at the normal price. They'll wait for it to go on sale. And that cat and mouse game with your buyers is really, really interesting to think through. And so that's a, it's just a difficult reality that your best customers, especially the price sensitive ones, will pay attention. You will have to justify, at least in their mind, what in the world you're doing with your prices and um and they'll anticipate the the best deal for them you know that's going to come up in the future yeah a couple of thoughts on that um i think a lot of uh, retailers have trained their buyers to expect sales some of them horrendous percentage of the time there's um something i only really see when i visit um, relatives who have tv at, at christmas um in uk dfs and they pretty much whenever i've seen an advert so furniture store that's been in business for years so it must work to some degree um they always have discounts i've never seen a season in which they don't have discounts um somehow <laughs> on everything which which begs the question of how, you know whether they just go with the absolute legal definition of minimum definition of a price before discounting it and that strikes me as a pretty good way of destroying your pricing power yeah. um and other extreme really great brands like chanel i understand will sort of leave one or two bottles of each type of perfume in it, in any given store that stores their products, you know, high street store or even online if they have good control. But they never really allow great plentifulness of the stock such that it's always kind of at a premium. It's always quite, what's the word, um, restricted in amount. Mm -hmm. So that strikes me as a much smarter way of doing it. How do you begin to build that kind of sophistication into a, an online version of your business? Well, I think the first thing you do is really make sure you pay attention to when you do discounts, how you do it, have a, a Google sheet or some kind of tracking document that says we put this item on sale on June 1st, you know, and the price was da da da. And just keep track is the first thing, you know, just have a have a history 
of your pricing decisions for your product. Uh, and so you can look back because you know how it is in mental shortcut in your mind. You're like, what can I do to make some money? Oh, I'll put something on sale. Oh, what should I put on sale? Oh, this item. Have I done that before? I don't remember, but whatever. I need money. So I'm going to, you know, you know, that's how we operate sometimes. It's like fly by the seat of your pants pricing. And that is not optimal. So. I'm absolutely with you that um by the way apologies if you're listening live i'm just having to unmute and mute twice but you don't want me coughing in your ear um i think one of the things i see a huge amount is that um people rely on amazon to tell them what their price has been historically which is really inaccurate a lot of the time or just it does the dates the data is actually not stored at least not in any easy mm -hmm. way to retrieve mm -hmm. so yeah tracking your pricing i think is absolutely basic but you're right a lot of us don't do it and we've yeah. all done that short term yeah. dash to cash so what's this uh, third unfortunate fact about yeah. pricing? Um, yeah, and Lizeth just asked in the comments a great question, which I'm going to add as like our fourth unfortunate fact, which right. we're talking about. But uh, the right. third unfortunate fact is, and don't worry, guys, we're going to have some suggestions, positive strategies for being pricing genius in a moment. So we'll get to the good stuff here. But, but the third unfortunate fact is customers also anticipate the price increases. So it's the reverse side of the coin of them anticipating the price discounting, they'll anticipate the price increases. And when they anticipate the price increases, they do just the opposite behavior. So they know you're going to raise the price. So what do they do in that situation? They buy early. You know, they'll buy today if they know you're going to raise the price tomorrow. So you got to be really, really thoughtful about when you do price increases. Um, if you do them every January 1st, for example, guess what December is going to look like for you? A wonderful sales month because everyone will be anticipating the price increase. People do this all the time. And it's really a cat and mouse game that we have to think about. You know, how are we raising our prices and how do we do it in such a way that customers don't just beat us uh, at, at our own game and just buy early, buy, you know, with the discount? Uh, uh, today's discount, which is your today's price. Um, and so that's the, uh, you know, the opposite side of the coin that you have to manage for. So one thing that strikes me uh, that's actually good news, um, and I know we're going to get onto more good news in a minute, is an inflationary environment generally. So all the news they're getting from whatever news sources, plus their experience is training customers to expect prices to go up so they're going to be quicker to jump on what they think of as a, a good bargain now in anticipation of a rising price of course the bad news is that um consumer um you know uh squeeze in consumer discretionary spending means that they're going to be possibly dumping your brand in favor of something cheaper so these are <laughs> the two yeah. sides but i think at least if we can um take advantage of that and build it into our own mentality about creating a sort of rhythm of pricing i think now is quite a good time to be able to do that actually um yeah i would just say so, that as it relates to inflation that is the the pernicious situation it's good on the one hand like let's say we know housing prices are going to go up by 15 percent or 20 percent next year because of inflation We're like it's just going to happen well we should buy a better house or our, our house or first house, whatever it is we should buy today. But if the sellers know that as well, then on their side, they're going to be ready, willing and able to just ratchet those prices right up. Oh, inflation's on the rise. Everyone can raise prices. I shoot. I too shall raise prices. And so you get in this spiral where uh, it really can be a, like a death spiral uh, or a you know, negative uh, feedback loop. So that so that's the challenge, and and I think we're in that uh, obviously in the U.S. And you know, I was shocked to be honest um, about being in England this last month. Um, you know, the number one thing that stood out to me as it relates to pricing. What's that? The prices in England for food. I'm not even joking. Probably half the price for a normal item if you just picked it up off the shelf for what we pay in the U.S. It is oh. radical. It was noticeable. And I was like, what in the world? We are paying so much here for food. And in England, I was like, this stuff's all on sale. It's like it's like on clearance pricing. It was crazy how big a difference it was in my mind when I we went to the little, you know, to the grocery store and and uh, started picking up items. It was it was very, very striking. So anyway, so just uh, 
uh, side commentary. Uh, Interesting. England, I, if England yeah. follows the U.S. in terms of uh, inflationary pricing for food, your pricing is going to double. Okay. Yeah, well, that's price isn't going to fall by half. I can guarantee. No, it that. isn't. No, I, I think um, there are there are a couple of factors behind that. One is that supermarkets really dominate the food industry here. So, as a percentage of income, Brits mm. have over the last sort of thirty years or so paid the lowest percentage of their income on food compared to anyone else in Europe. And that's partly because maybe we, we traditionally don't value it as much as the French or Italians, which I could say is true from my experience of their culture. But mm -hmm. I think it's partly because the suppliers of the raw ingredients, milk or whatever, have mm -hmm. been squeezed to death. However, what that means is that we've got a very low base from which it's shooting up very quickly, which of course people aren't used to. So the other thing that tells me is that whatever you're used to is what you think of as normal. You think of it as shockingly low here. I think of it as mm -hmm. normal. If mm -hmm. it goes up 30%, everyone up in arms and there'll be riots in the streets whereas you'll be saying hey that's 70 percent cheaper than my bill what are you complaining no, about I'll, I'll be saying there's still another 25 percent for it to go up you know yeah i mean it's not, it sure. hasn't gone up high enough it's gone up 30 percent. but yeah that's to the point of this whole idea because we become sensitive to our own normalized pricing for us and yeah it can be psychologically painful so um, we were going to talk about the coming back to uh, Lizeth has got a, a question that you wanted to raise, which I thought was a, yeah. a good one as well. So do you yeah. want to read that one out and I'll see if I can put my Amazon hat on here? Yeah, I and mean, I've got some thoughts on this one as well. It's a great question, which is what do you do when Amazon deactivates a listing and or suggests a price that won't even pay their own fees or like a price? They, they recommend a price that is non-logical to you. Mm. And we talked in prior podcast conversations, Michael, about the number one pricing power uh, tool. I think it's a prior episode just before this one. Um, it, it, the number one pricing power tool that you have as a seller is location. And, and on the e-commerce side, that means you, you have the options to sell on Shopify direct to consumer. You can sell on eBay. You can sell on Etsy. You can sell on Walmart. You can sell on a Macare Libre. Uh, you can sell on Poshmark, uh, offer up Craigslist. You can, if you choose, sell on Amazon as well. The question is, where do you get an optimal price outcome uh, in those marketplaces? And so, so location is really part of the answer. It, the answer isn't to fiddle around in Amazon in such a way that you make them do what you want to do. Now, maybe there is a technical solution Michael knows of, but the truth from a macro perspective is look location broadly and having the options to sell in different places creates pricing power. Michael, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, so Liz, sorry to hear of your uh, pain there, if that's you. Um, it really depends on why Amazon's doing it. There's got to be a few different reasons. So uh, if you can pop into the comments why, um, then I might be able to troubleshoot it a bit further. But to your point, Jason, I guess, um, it, the only thing technically that strikes me that's an obvious one is if you are selling it cheaper somewhere else on the web then you're asking for amazon to mm -hmm. basically if not deactivate your listing but you'll lose the buy box which effectively means you'll lose 80 percent of your traffic and 80 percent of your sales yeah. um other than that it, you are vulnerable to amazon's little way sometimes which aren't extremely obvious why and to your point i think it's another reason to consider you know, getting your own DTC sites mm -hmm. up up and running, which is a different strategy and a different question. But uh, any specific questions then ask. But the, I imagine there'll be more than one Amazon seller experiencing this kind of thing in the next while yeah. because Amazon will effectively implement its own ideas of price controls, which they don't mm -hmm. advertise, they don't discuss in the national press or, or media, aren't mm -hmm. discussed in the House of Congress, but they suddenly decide to put in, implement their own kind of we used to have a thing called the price commission which my um, father-in-law worked for in the 1970s and they kind of create their own one in times of what they think of as national crisis uh, mm -hmm. that certainly seemed to happen in pandemic right so um, i think sometimes you just don't know that they've decided these policies yeah. <laughs> and that's just the luck of the draw yeah. um so tell us about the good news then so we, we've talked about the problems a great deal um what are the what are the solutions to these things how do we remedy these challenges yeah, there are three things that you can do that I'd want to mention today and really encourage everybody with. Um, the first one is um, you have the opportunity to create a unique selling proposition that will really, really help your pricing strategy. And I know this is kind of an odd uh, set of items to push together. Most of us have heard of the phrase unique selling proposition, USP. We've heard that in the context of branding. And then a context of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, creating your presentation on the internet, that kind of thing. 
and we haven't really tied it back into your pricing strategy. But I want to just remind everybody that the that second word there is selling, you know, the unique selling proposition. And so because a lot of times we think, oh, creative USP. OK, I want to be the brand known as uh, I don't know something, you know, we just make it up in our mind. And but the reality is what you really want to do with your USP is figure out what the customer would see as valuable in what you're doing and find the synergy related to what the customer would validate and support with higher prices. And so how do you do that? It's complicated, but there are ways to do it. One way to do it is, um, for example, um, will a customer pay for an item because it's local, made local, source local? This is becoming very, very true in food. You know, customers will pay a premium if it's local um, and, uh, you know, uh, organic. And that, and so if you're in the food category, you know that, you know that there's a pricing premium for local and organic. Um, I bought some honey, uh, you know, not long ago and it was made locally. And in the honey world, they say, you know, if you buy local honey and eat local honey, it'll help your allergies. Cause I don't know, the, the bees have got the pollen from the local plants and you're eating it and somehow your allergies will help. So you see how that's a, it's a, a selling positioning tool that justifies a higher price point, that USP of being the local locally sourced item underscores this reason why you should pay for it and, and even pay for it as a premium. Um, so that's one angle that, lo, you know, is it local and can that be the thing you use to charge for a higher price? But there are other angles as well. Um, and, you know, the thing that you want to think through is what could you do with your product to create that kind of unique angle? As we mentioned, I was just in England. We wanted to see gardens of England, you know, the famous gardens of England. And um, so we had our Google, you know, we're, we're Googling around and we're like looking on the internet and we're looking at trip advisors and stuff like that, asking people like, what are the best gardens to go to? And people would give us their advice. Well, we heard that Blenheim uh, um, Palace is the birthplace of Winston Churchill and they have beautiful gardens there. But really what we heard was birthplace of Winston Churchill, like 150 times yeah. we heard birthplace of Winston Churchill. So we went there and it, it was a total disappointment. The <laughs> gardens were just hardly, it was like a like a local park, your local city park. It was like this, they had big trees. That was their claim to fame in terms of the gardening stuff. It was a total bust, but it was really expensive to get into. And of course we walked through the palace and it was like, whatever. But they had clearly clearly dominated the unique selling proposition with this birthplace of winston churchill uh branding and idea and it got us to go it got us to take a half day and all things being equal if i could go back over you know uh, the trip i would have not gone there and i would have found yeah. a cool a cool actual real garden that was, you know, a proper British garden that was really impressive because we did see some, but they were really not that easy to find and they yeah. weren't really marketed that well. So you get the idea. You want to have a unique selling proposition that does the job. But of course, you don't want to dissatisfy your customer. You don't want them to have a bad experience like, oh, they said this was going to be, you know, something and it turned out to not be you don't you don't want to disappoint you want to find something that it, it has truth to it and attracts the right kind of buyer and they're willing to pay the you know kind of the premium price for it so that usp piece to me is a huge way to justify you know pricing so um first of all let's reflect on your um british experience i think that that's a typical sort of british tourist experience that that they brand i guess a lot of what britain has to offer is really just to kind of brand name perhaps for you know anglophile americans particularly yeah. or you know other people who yeah. think it's all about history and you know winston church was an impressive character by the way um mother was american i think so sort of an anglo-american himself but he you know blend paris is very famous i've never thought of it as a garden and now i, I that feeling is reinforced and then you but the other thing to reflect on of course is just because you've hooked somebody and got to pay once doesn't mean that's a great idea because you're now living effectively a, a negative review online mm -hmm. um albeit it won't really affect that many people unless you, you know listeners were planning to pop into blending paris palace next week but um 
in a place like Amazon, that's a bad idea. On any Shopify sort, that's not a, a good idea. So um, I guess that there's got to be a message to product match, right? They got the message incredibly strong, but they can't. They, the, 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 they got something misaligned between your expectations and what you got. Um, so again, if you want to build a strong brand, you've got to make sure you line those up, right? So it's never just about. All I would say to reflect on that is it's never just about marketing. It's marketing plus product and product yeah. development needs to tie in with understanding the cons consumer. I would say. Mm -hmm. Talking about the food examples make me think of an awful lot of thing. I've just been in France, and so they're obsessed with great food. And there are lots and lots and lots of different types of USPs that you can build in, some of which don't sit so easily in a sort of mass-produced online type product. I mean, sort of handmade, traditional materials, genuine manufacturing process. You can have elements of those, I think. Um, Gluten-free, hypoallergenics are safe for people with all sorts of intolerances these days. And there are equivalents in you know, other things. I don't know, for example, cleaning uh, materials. And then there's that kind of uh, the other thing that the, the Europeans are obsessed with. It, you know, the wine is only allowed to be called a Bordeaux wine if it's from a certain region. Champagne is, you know, if it's anywhere outside the Champagne region, you can't call it Champagne. It's fizzy wine, even though it's basically Champagne. And there's a sort of that's a really hard to engineer kind of trust and quality brand identity. But that's the ultimate defensible thing, I think, because yeah. I can imagine that Champagne sales may go down over the recession i'm sure they will i don't see the price necessarily going down because people it want it to be expensive in a way so um how yeah. do we uh, start to you know implement this stuff how do we really create a, a brand that has that kind of pricing power yep it starts with you know a, an obsession with your customers desire for the specific product that you're offering and really thinking through what does that look like how do you put it together what will they and won't they pay for what do they see value in um, those are all just amazing questions to sort of nerd out over as you start to work on how your USP can support your pricing. So um, there are other ways you can be a genius pricer. Let me mention them. But first, before that, let me return our conversation to uh, Lizeth's question earlier, which was Amazon's proposing ridiculous pricing because uh, for some reason. And uh, we asked her why. And her comment is she thought that in retail stores, the prices were lower. So this is uh, very interesting. We had a client, Michael, who um, was very successful on Amazon and then thought, why not also sell on Chewy? Because it was a pet related uh, you know, product. And so she started selling on Chewy. And on Chewy, they were pretty liberal with their management of the prices. And they would put stuff on discount or sale. And and, and, and when they did that, Amazon immediately cottoned on to it and said, well, they would just affect her price. I mean, it was like Amazon was clear. They were not going to be undersold by Chewy. And so they would, uh, I don't know that they suspended listings, but it was clearly, you know, flagged up as like, this is a problem. And the Chewy people were basically like, not really, they were kind of cavalier about it. They were, they weren't really uh, supportive <laughs> and so so ultimately she stopped selling on chewy and so lizeth if your product or the product that you're selling is out in retail spaces listed on the internet for a lower price amazon will um will demand uh price parity um and so you you won't be able to have it if you control it you won't be have it be able to have it out in a retail setting or other marketplaces um uh, at a at a lower price um, and having Amazon have to sell the higher priced version, they won't do it. So, Michael, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. You have a different take on it, but that's what I've seen at least. So, no, 100%. I, I've seen this many times. I mean, I think um, one question I would have, obviously, for Lizeth, but also for anyone listening, is if you're reselling a product, you have to be realistic about what you engage in retail arbitrage, uh, as coined by our friend Chris Green, uh, means a difference in price between two different markets for the same product or service right that's what arbitrage is and if you are in a market where you are pricing higher than it is elsewhere then there's not a particularly great reason why somebody should buy from you and okay if you can get away with it then why not that's not particularly bad but amazon is not in the business of enabling that <laughs> amazon wants to be if not exactly always the lowest cost provider it's seen as the value provider right and that's mm -hmm. their branding that's their positioning in the market they're not always the cheapest stuff is cheaper on ebay quite often but 
um, you know, that you're, go you're swimming against uh, the tide. You're swimming against the tide of a mighty river called Amazon. Don't do it. I mean, it's just not a winning strategy. If it's a private label product, then you need to get control of where your products are being distributed. It may be that people are buying them and reselling them illegally in some way, in which case my advice is to keep it simple and do a couple of things. One is to send a cease and desist letter if you can find who they are and get some contact details. That's often effective. Um, the second one is um, to go and buy the available stock. And, you know, if they're selling on Amazon, then um mm -hmm. doesn't sound like it's the same issue but you know finding the stock buying it trying to rag, rag up as many flag up as many uh sort of you know flags with the different marketplaces that's being sold to that it's not authentic or whatever it is or just mm -hmm. buy the stock and keep it because it's destroying your value your yeah. pricing power so one a few thoughts yeah one other thought in that regard and i think this works michael but you could also create a new uh, listing and have it be a kitted product add something to it sell the item plus a rubber band or plus a you know screwdriver or plus a whatever it is that adds uh incremental value then you're selling two items and you're out of the asin that's in conflict because it's really not the same item that you're selling and that will give you your pricing discretion back um absolutely one last tweak to that idea which is that makes a lot of sense and that could be difficult to implement physically a bit yeah, of work but sure. yeah. definitely a good plan another thought and you should go and you know read up about this Liz Ethel or anyone else in this situation that's there's, there's something to do with the, I think called the first sale doctrine but I remember speaking to CJ Rosenbaum who's a New York based lawyer who specializes in Amazon sellers and if you offer a guarantee or warranty of some kind linked with the product and you make sure you're clear about that, then if somebody sells that product without warranty, then technically they're kind of not selling the same product. I'm a bit vague about the details, so you'd have yeah. to go and read up about it and make sure you educate yourself properly and fully about it. But bottom line is if you're having to do lots of funny tricks like this, that's probably a sign that the market you're in is not a great market to be in, I would suggest mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So okay. there you go. Back to our... Back to our list here. Um, we've got a, another way to create pricing genius. Uh, two more to go. And so let me mention the next one. The next one is you can create your own anchors. Now, an anchor in pricing economics terms is this mental like signpost or, or, or milestone that the customer has in their mind about what is an appropriate price for your item. That's the anchor price. So, for example, if you say, hey, I want a, a, a compact car uh, in the United States and, I, you know, really it's just for my kid to drive and, um, and I don't want to spend a lot. What price comes to my mind? 25,000 US dollars. Okay. You know, I want a luxury vehicle. It's going to be super amazing. Like maybe like a uh, European, what price comes to my mind? Oh, six figures. Definitely. You know, so, so those are anchors and, and the, so you will, you will live your life as a price setter in the environment of anchors. They are there in the mind of the customer. The only question is, do you control them? And the genius sellers control them. And so the classic example of this is like the, the high end luxury uh, purse sellers. And I was like this example, I use it too much, but you know, high end luxury purse sellers, you go in and there's like a, like the Birkin bag or something like that. It was like a thirty-four thousand dollar purse, you know? Like, wow, thirty four thousand dollar purse. Who in their right mind would pay pay for that purse? I don't know, but there's one sitting next to it for four hundred and ninety nine dollars. Eh, I'll buy that one, you know? And but then you just realize, wow, I just paid five hundred dollars for a purse. Now I'm not a purse buyer per se. And so this is not a market that I actually like spend money in, but you get the idea. Um, if you can create an anchor, then you have created the psychological space in which the customer is evaluating your products. And so how do you do this? Well, the long and the short of it is you create a high price product and you create a high price product because the high price product creates an anchor for your other products. So, you know, how often does you know, the super high end luxury item sell. I don't know, but a lot of, I know there are a lot of Ferrari t-shirts that sell, <laughs> a lot of Ferrari hats that sell, a lot of Ferrari sweatshirts that sell. Uh, how many Ferraris sell? Well, they, they might make more off their merch than they do off their cars. I'm not sure, but you get the idea. Um, you create the high priced item and it gives you 
cover uh, or the context in which the normal priced item makes more sense to the customer. So, Michael, what are your thoughts on anchors, controlling them? If you have other examples that you come, you know, you like or come to your mind, but love your thought on it. Yeah, a few. I mean, not very e-commerce specific, but if you it, location, as we talked about in the past, or the context things are incredibly important. So, to your purse, or as we call it, a handbag, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm example if you're in if you walk into certain stores in oxford street or i guess you know in some in the right locations in new york or wherever then you kind of expect incredibly high prices because everything else around is high price the decor the 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 reputation the brand will push you towards expecting that obviously online with your own website you can gradually after a huge amount of work build towards that unfortunately on a an amazon sort of uh, in an amazon or marketplace context it's hard to um engineer because basically you're you're vulnerable to whatever amazon stacks against you in the uh, search engine rankings and they don't really stack like with like it's whatever sells a lot relative to a keyword right so you could put a word handbag in if you're really insane and try and rank for the word handbag but even luxury handbag in the amazon world luxury might mean anything 50 100 bucks upwards i guess mm -hmm. instead of five thousand. so um i think you need to do everything you can if you do sell on amazon or any marketplace to engineer to get away from the search engine results page as the comparison just before the actual buying point. So even an Amazon store is a lot better than an Amazon search engine page. And if you can build a reputation within a narrow niche such that people do click through to your Amazon store and you sell a lot of stuff for $300, then, you know, $50 looks cheap, etc. cetera. Um, and you can do that within an Amazon listing with parent child relationships. So if you have variations, if you have a, you know, um, it's going to have to be of the same kind of product. So it's much less sophisticated than, you know a fashion store or something for example yeah. but if you sell i don't know silk neckties you could sell one for 300 dollars and then one for 50 one for 35 and the 35 looks cheap in that context mm -hmm. and that certainly is something i've seen my clients do to a limited degree and it works very well when they do it it's just work to implement it but again um this is where i think in the end this is the true power of having your own store and creating your own context within that world you can create your own anchors and you just can't really do that to a powerful level in a marketplace it's just the customers kind of create the anchors although they're allowed to and enabled by amazon but i think yeah. to your point you're really a price taken on a price maker in that in that no context. i mean i well mm, i I would this say is. the best way to be the price maker is to do the versioning that you described and you said your clients that do it or in the context in which they can do it, they see success. And that's classic. You know, you've got that this happens at so many industries. You've got the ultra premium edition signed by the you know, <laughs> autographed edition copy or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, platinum, gold made with made with real diamonds, whatever it is. And then you've got the kind of like the economy version. That is classic that car makers started doing that a long time ago. I'm sure many other people pioneered it as well, but you too can apply that to private label branding, have a premium or luxury edition. And Apple does that with all of its devices. And it's a very, very common pricing strategy. And that is the way in which you, you know, you can kind of create your anchor in that bubble or in your, in your little set uh, to your point, Michael. So like on your brand page is way better presentation of that than in the BSR rankings where people wouldn't see the premium edition, they might just see the economy edition. Um, okay, let's move on though, because we got one more to cover if it's all right. Mm -hmm. um, and that is another way to be a pricing genius is to create a discount club for your buyers. And we've helped people implement this. We have this system in our own uh, you know, e-commerce environment uh, and this works. So basically what you're doing is you're saying to your entire community, here's the way in which you can get a discount in an ongoing way. It's called Amazon Prime <laughs> or you know, it's called whatever, you know, whatever membership program name you want to call it, call it your discount club, uh, call it your, you know, loyalty and rewards, uh, you know, club. Now, some of these can be free, like a loyalty program, but others can be paid uh, where people will give you a hundred dollars to be in the discount club and then they get a standing discount. That is very easy to execute on Shopify, um, impossible to execute on Amazon, 
I think. I, I mean, I don't know any way to do that, but you absolutely can do it uh, in Shopify and it creates the environment in which you're giving the customer what they want. You're, you're saying you want a discount? Here's a discount. Let's have fun together. Like let's 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 sell some stuff and buy some stuff. Um, and you, you create a good time out of it. And customers can be really, really responsive uh, to discount clubs or membership pricing, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's definitely something to look into. If you can set it up for your business with your customers, you can do really well and bake in their loyalty and their commitment and and uh, repeat purchases and and even have it be profitable as a line item in your business uh, just because you set it up and they you know you charge people to to be a part of it. In essence, it's a product. It's a virtual product that has uh, you know no cost of goods. It has future imposed discounts on your items. It's very interesting uh, economics all wrapped up in there. Absolutely. I, I know that um, Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's right-hand man for decades now, what, Boxer Hathaway is a massive fan of Costco. I think you're, you're mm -hmm. obviously a massive fan because you, you mention it very frequently. Yeah. And I guess that having that cash flow from the membership uh, coming in all the time is a beautiful thing if you can engineer it. Mm -hmm. I, I think for most physical product sellers, I suspect that's going to be hard to do, but you'd have to be very niche. And I guess you'd have to be you know, definitely selling on your own well-branded channels. Um, yeah. I think for those who sell on Amazon, there are a couple of elements of this, which is not quite the same thing. Obviously, the, the most obvious thing is subscribe and save on Amazon, and that does increase average order value. I suspect that for most Amazon sellers, that's underused. I think most people tend to look at it as an over as a sort of optional extra, whereas Amazon tends to push it pretty hard. And most stuff as a consumer on Amazon, I've seen recently yeah. anything that can be subscribed and save. I've seen for me personally, they're offering as a, an option before the one-off purchase. So they're really pushing it. They're trying to make it the default thing. So yeah. that obviously that can increase average order value and include, you know, future cash flow and the relationship between how much it costs you to get the customer and and the, the value of it, etc. So that's all worth doing. The second thing, more strategic point around that is to think really hard, especially if you're going to sell on a marketplace, because cross-selling, upselling, downselling and and future purchases are all so hard to engineer compared to your own site. To really consider hard um what product lines you could have mm -hmm. or add that can be subscribed and save if you sell you know dog bowls why not sell dog shampoo for example i mean it's a simple idea but it's it's really important and the only other thing really um uh, on on amazon is is that you could in theory and i've not seen anyone do this yet but there's nothing to stop you having marketing assets outside of amazon which capture email addresses or any other form of contact sms for example and that you could then effectively have a sort of informal discount club but they they buy on amazon the difficulty mm -hmm. with that of course is they go to amazon and amazon itself is, is sort of going to offer them something better mm -hmm. value than you can offer and they get distracted to buy somebody else's stuff um so you can sort of take bits of it off amazon but i think again this is a great reason to run your own store in the longer term because it's so hard to implement this stuff off that i mean if you've had clients that have done you know both have sold on marketplaces and have tried to work towards their own DTC side. Have you found people that have managed to implement these these things off off their own DTC site, or is it always got to be under your control? It's easiest under your control. You yeah. know, uh, the subscribe and save functionality on Shopify is really really good. There are you know recurring uh, you know uh, uh, re rebuying tools or you know subscribe and save tools apps that are that work great. And every, we have clients that use them every week when we log in, we're like, how many subscribe and save customers? Yeah. Now it's like, it goes up, 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 up. And um, the only question is how long do they stay in the program? You know, what's the churn rate, but that's a great thing. It's a, it's a really a fourth idea here, but it's a bit different than a discount club, but it's, it's, it's simpler to implement actually. And, um, and it works really well um, in, in addition. So, yeah, I, I would say, you know, those are valuable reasons to have a Shopify site and build a brand and to sell direct to consumers. Absolutely. Well, yeah. man, I know that you're struggling through here with your your voice. Hopefully you'll be back to 100% health soon. Let me wrap the show up here. If you're listening on uh, the live uh, recordings of this on um, the social media platforms, thank you so much. Feel free to comment underneath if you're, you're listening via recording. And of course, if you're listening to this in Shopify, sorry, in Spotify or Apple podcast player or wherever pods are cast, then we would love your subscription, your highest review. And I'd love to have you check out the other episodes. Scroll back in time. We have done a ton on pricing. 
We've also done shows on, of course, all other aspects of e-commerce. There's always a new wrinkle, a new angle to talk about, and we love to do that. So thank you so much for supporting the show. Really is an honor. If you want to check out more of Michael's work, you could do that at the what? AmazingFBA.com. Is that the right? It's amazing. That- <laughs> so the podcast is at AmazingFBA.com, where you can also get access to the 10K Collective uh, podcast. It's pretty much the same content these days. Um, and we've and? just hit, uh, you know, collectively between the Amazing FBA podcast, 10K Collective podcast, and the e-commerce leader this summer, we quietly passed a million downloads over the lifetime of, of all of those. And wow. um, we're well into f- um, six figures with the, the e-commerce leader as well. So there's plenty of people out there listening. So come Amazing. join the party. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for supporting the show. It's really an honor. We love talking about e-commerce stuff. And of course, it's great to have you jump in with us and ask questions live. So anyway, all that to say, really appreciate your support for the show. And we'll wrap it up here. Take care, guys.